Um, hello. Uh, we're going to present to you now some of the interactive media, transmedia and games projects, and we're going to start with MEMO. Um, MEMO is an AER museum app uh, that I worked on with Katie davis Bletterman, the director, standing, standing next to me. Um, the reason why we did the project is because we wanted to experiment a little bit with AR and tracking and see how this works because it's a cool technology and also uh, Katie thought why not bring young audience in the museum and uh, get them closer to art so they can experience something that we would like them to experience through a medium that they probably like because it's so new and cool. Um, so, in a few words, what happens uh, during the app is that you have a gang of digital artists and they all live in a museum, but you can only see them through the AR app. So you have to use the AR app with your smartphone, uh, find them in the paintings, then you have some animations that Katie did that look pretty mm, amazing. Um, and then you have to collect the objects from the paintings, put them on your avatar, which you can see through scanning uh, code on a sticker that you have, and you can dress it up and do it as you wish and take photos. So Katie is going to tell you a bit more about how the app works. Okay, so um, Dennis basically told you how it's played, but um, here's some of the gameplay with pictures. So on the, right si uh, on the left side, you see the original artwork that you're going to see in a museum. And on the right side, yeah, on the left side, the original, on the right side is the new version for the app. So if you hold your camera towards the original, it changes into something that has a similar outline, but a different style. And in the middle, you can see some children that have come to us and played the game already. Okay, so the picture changes and uh, UI pops up. And this UI um, shows you that you can collect some of the objects that are in the picture. In this case, it's a base cap and if you click on it, um, uh, a pop-up pops up. Yeah, a UI <laughs> pops up <laughs> with a base cap on it and you know that this object is in your inventory. Um, yeah, and so you go around the museum, you collect stuff, and in the end you design an avatar that you get on this plate. It's something that you get in the museum with your entrance card, and uh, yeah. We have the prototype here with us, and I think it's best if we just show it to you because it's easier to understand. Okay, okay. Uh, I will just walk around with it. Okay, so I need to go to the front to actually see the picture myself. So here's the camera. It's all you can see in the uh, prototype. And if you hold it towards the picture, it um, changes its style. And I mean, it's a very small display, so you're probably not going to see exactly. But um, you can collect different things right now, like, for example, her pants or her bracelets or her jacket. So I'm just gonna collect something for you. I don't know, this is cool. <laughs> yeah, this is okay, so this is uh, something for your hat, it's roses. Um, and you see that you've collected the object. You say okay, and it gives you an indication to look at your avatar, um, which I'm gonna show right now. This is the avatar, <laughs> uh, and he has uh, roses on his head right now. You see it? Cool. Okay, I'm gonna take my microphone back. Yeah, so um, this is prob basically done with a couple of different um, pictures, and you have many objects in the end, and you just design it the way you want to. And um, yeah, you become an artist yourself in the museum. Yeah, so thank you for listening.
And yeah, the prototype is here, so if you want to try it out, just talk to me. So uh, the next project that we're going to present is Sherpa. Thank you, Katie. You're welcome. Um, it's, a, it's a real installation using projection mapping and VR without the head-mounted display. I worked on that project with Christian Kreitmann, the director, and Martin Kögel, the art director. Um, that's our, our, how it looks like. That's a, a screenshot from our experience trailer. That's the core team, but there were 18 people working on that project. That's pretty crazy, and we're really happy that they did. And now Christian's going to tell you a bit about the story and how he got inspired to start the project. Okay. Um, yeah, so in 2016, I was in Nepal for seven months. I was working for a development company. And uh, yeah, in my free time, I also hiked and went to the summits and to the Everest regions. And what you can see here is six months after my arrival, and I decided to, uh, with a friend of mine, to decide to go on this Everest supply track. And as you can see, it's damaged, it's muddy, it's uh, also there were lots of yaks and mule caravans, and usually tourists don't see that part of the Everest region. Uh, because they have flight up to 2,000 meters and start from that point. And uh, yeah, so what I learned also from the Sherpas there is how much effort is uh, in that industry of the uh, tourism. And uh, yeah, throughout the talks, you also notice that some of the Sherpas, they risk their life just that some of uh, our mountaineers can reach some summits. And yeah, so one question came into my mind is like, how far do we have to go to fulfill the dream of a real mountaineer, especially when you look at this kind of thought of freedom in our society. And then when you look at that picture, <coughs> there's also the big question, where is the line between service and abuse? And yeah, we wanted to express that thoughts and also these questions and bring it to uh, an audience here in Europe. And after six months development, we were able to do this one and now we will show the trailer. For me, Serpa, it's assistant guy these days. Serpa means assistant guide who helps the trackers when they are in need and we help them in climbing and trekking. You have to be always going to be concerned about the safety of the tourists, which is kind of difficult in the situation uh, of Nepal, because in Nepal things can change very quickly. people I notice on tracks they really have no idea what they're getting themselves into because it's advertised as being so fun and so easy almost and then you see a lot of clients uh, suffering instead of quality tourism we are kind of focused in quantity tourism and I think that's changing the industry but in a negative way The tourist industry is just seems to be getting crazier and crazier. Business is booming and anyone can do anything. This is a bit frightening. Anyone can go trekking, anyone can be a guide, anyone can do anything. People are naive and they just jump for a trip, pay all the bucks without knowing for sure if people are qualified or not. That's the downside. The upside is it's definitely bringing in a lot of good money for our country and good and jobs. Once again, from our side, we need to have much more better facilities for everybody involved in this trade, not just the clients, but also for the guides and the agencies so that we can have safe tourism. Okay, yeah, so uh, what you saw is a four-player local multiplayer installation and uh, it works with two projectors inside a mountain uh, who do um, 
back projection on a plexiglass surface. And uh, the four users here interviews with non-fictional content through their headphones. So they, uh, the player as a tourist tries to get to the summit. And uh, yeah, while doing that, <coughs> He got support from the Sherpas, and uh, yeah, he can decide how much he want to also abuse the, the Sherpa or not. And for those players who are not actively in the mountain, we also discover, uh, de de developed a timeline where you can inform yourself about the uh, Sherpas. And for those who want to just listen to the uh, interviews, you can. Uh, get the audio app, what you can see here on the right side, and you can listen to the player's audio. And um, yeah, so in Nepal there's the saying, tourists come for the mountains and stay for the people, and that's, that was kind of the basic structure for the project for us. And uh, yeah, so we, we interviewed uh, the Sherpas, and uh, for example, Tendi Sherpa, who is 20 years in the business, he's running his own travel agency. Then we had Sushant Dahal, he uh, started his business one year ago. Then also Anub Atikari, he is like the classic mountain guide. And we also got the chance to interview Sarina Rai, um, the one of the raw female uh, guides in a male dominated country in, like Nepal. And yeah, so um, the gameplay was a little bit uh, also transformative because at the beginning the people are really fascinated by the technology, so they just want to play around in the space, they want to use the new technology. And uh, then, yeah, so we discovered in the testings that it doesn't make sense to bring content at the beginning because they can't concentrate on the audio. So uh, throughout the gameplay, um, we increase the content more and more and also sometimes reduce the interaction so that people can really focus on the story. And yeah, so we had lots of non-fictional content and how we uh, developed that. I uh, will now tell you Martin Kögel. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, So yeah, um, as Christian said, I am yeah the art director of Sherpa, um, and um, yeah I'm yeah more or less I'm the the classical um, game artist. So I never did um, anything visuals um, for non-fictional content before. So it was really interesting and very challenging, but really uh, yeah a cool and nice experience for me as an art director. So um, yeah, as you can see. Um, at first, yeah, the the, um, the design and the visuals were very um, clean and graphical, and I some kind of, yeah I liked it in in some way, but not, we we saw that it doesn't fit the the atmosphere and the feeling of um, of Nepal and of the story at all. So um, yeah, I will show you the the process. So um, but at the same time. We, um, yeah, besides code and art, we developed um, prototypes, different prototypes. And yeah, as you can see, we always had some kind of um, yeah, physical prototypes that we can um, yeah, look with the, with the perspective and stuff. And um, yeah, we also meet, um, yeah, for example, Tandy Sharpa in Munich, who visits, uh, or who was on a visit for his German, or yeah, even German clients and stuff. And, um, yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, after after a few discussions, we decided to change the art style completely. So I tried different um, yeah different tools, uh, different techniques. Um, yeah, as you can see here, I tried some VR paintings, post processing tools, yeah, classical sketches, <laughs> and some three D tools. Um, yeah, and um, I want to. Yeah, I want to develop a different style, not this typical gamey style, more or less a, uh, yeah, some kind of illustrational style to to focus on the story and um, yeah, and with with every every story from from uh, from Chris and yeah, with more pictures and articles about Nepal, I'm slowly getting or was getting into it and um, yeah, and so I developed some different stuff. Um, yeah, and the first design I want to finish um, was the Sherpas itself. 
because um, yeah, the main focus is on the Sherpas, the story and uh, yeah, their lives and uh, experiences with tourists and um, yeah. So I want to design the Sherpas first and build the, the whole world around them. So I come up with this one. Yeah, as you can see, um, the, the yeah the first pictures are the final designs for the Sherpas, um, and I want to look. I, I want to. Yeah, I want to. The, or the, the, uh, the design should be very um, organic and colorful and warm, friendly. And I try to visualize the backstories of the characters. Um, yeah, as you hear from the from the real interviews. Um, and as you can see, the yeah, the the picture down. Uh, the, yeah, the picture under the tour, uh, under the shepherds. Um Yeah, the tourists and they should look really um, yeah clean and artificial and. Um, yeah, not not that um, yeah organic. So on the right side, you can see some assets I built for the yeah for the houses and for the yeah packages and stuff. So um, yeah, as I said, besides the the game design and uh, the art, we always develop the physical um, physical prototypes. So you can see um, yeah the first one the, on the left side. It was the first prototype, it was really <laughs> crappy <laughs> and improvised. Um, the second one was with um, copper wires and custom-made 3D printed um, tiles, more or less like a tent. Yeah, like you can, um, clipping the wires together, so it's built these kind of structures and we filled the polygons, or the polygon-like structure with paper, and um, yeah, with a, with a projector from the inside, we pro uh, yeah, projected the visuals on, on the surface. Um, the third one is, yeah, it, it is uh, a tent, for s some kind of a tent, <laughs> and it was for the, the, um, yeah, the, the size and the, the surface. So yeah, it was time to build the real mountain, so as, it, as you can see um, here, yeah, we tried different shapes, um, we had a lot of dependencies to check because we want to, yeah, the, the beamers should um, project on the whole surface, not on parts. And yeah, we had to do a lot of um, CAD and architectural stuff to <laughs> to produce the construction plans for the carpenter, Benjamin, as you can see here. So um, yeah, it was yeah, the digital construction um, we did for the, yeah, for the carpenter. He built the mountain with us and the f you can see the final product. So yeah, and after the final product, I could um, yeah design and model and texturing all the stuff um, yeah with the the landscape and all the, the the yeah the needed assets. So yeah, um, do you want to say something? <laughs> um, yeah, I can say that we're really happy doing that project, and uh, it was really, from the production side, really complex, so we're really glad it pulled through. Uh, we also recently won the VR Now program, so we're allowed to keep working on it at the Animations Institute in Film Academy in Ludwigsburg, where uh, Christian and uh, um, Martin are, have uh, graduated recently. Um, it's a project that we really like because it's, apart from the technical part, which is really innovative, using VR without the headset, projection mapping, and so on and so forth, it's, the content is really rich and humanistic, and it's talking about real people who exist. And uh, our cause is to show each and every one of our testers that they also have a role uh, being a tourist, and that they should take that role seriously because it can influence a country, a land, the locals, everyone. Thank you. And <laughs> and the next project we're going to present to you is Dream Makers. So I'm going to ask Lucas to join me in the stage. The rest of the team uh, couldn't be here due to technical reasons. So Dream Makers is a project we did uh, with uh, Lucas and the, uh, Lucas was the technical director of the project. Uh, we did it in the third year, at, uh, uh, like the first year, but the third year of the study program at uh, Film Academy. 
So we were asked to create an intellectual property which would be consisted of a trailer and experience. So my team decided from the beginning to create a game and not an experience, experience and I'm really glad for that. So we were brainstorming and we were wondering what can we do and how can we make this, that project interesting for everyone. And uh, I came up with an idea about from Greek mythology, the uh, mighty god Morpheus who is creating dreams. Um, and the team uh, kind of liked it, so we went on with it. And that's what our funky, colorful Morpheus looks like in his lab, holding all those. Uh, you might have seen him because uh, we were lucky enough to get our trailer be the ITF, ETFS trailer uh, 2018. So it's all over Stuttgart by now, like the pink uh, unicorn. So let's watch the trailer. Yeah, so it was a big success for, for each and every one of us. And it was like the first time we had a project being shown all over a city with posters and pictures. And we're really, really proud. Um, that's the whole team that worked on the project. Um, and going on with the game. So we wanted to try something new again. So we said, OK, we're going to do VR. But VR feels kind of like. Um, not that comfortable because you have this um, uh, headset and then you're alone and you don't know what's happening around you. So we thought, okay, we're going to make it a bit more social. So we're going to add a tablet and we're going to add a player. So those two have something to do with each other and uh, communicate and interact. And then we also had Jan, our other technical director or interactive designer, as he wants to be called, who was really passionate about vibration, lights, and uh, uh, like physical feedback. And he really pushed through and got all the, this stuff in the game. And we're really happy about it. So we also have uh, a chair that is vibrating if you do something wrong in the game. We have lights that are uh, lighting the scene according to what you do in the game. We have sound. Um, and that was in Select in Zurich in uh, November 2017, where we showed our game. And the lady you see back there was sitting on that um, chair. And every time her co-player would do something wrong, she, the, the chair would shake, the lights would go crazy, uh, and so on. So what you do in the game actually is like you have two devices. One is uh, the Morpheus having the tablet who has all the recipes uh, about the dream and guides the assistant and his assistant is in VR. He has to collect the ingredients he gets from Morpheus, mix them together and the mutual goal is to create dreams. Um, so now we're gonna show you the experience trailer we created for our game.
Yeah, so uh, it came across pretty well, and we recently got featured in a TED talk from Denise Kensel um, uh, because that social character that we wanted to give uh, in VR was really appreciated. It was like new and different until now every VR experience would be isolated and you would be alone in that VR world. So we can say it worked and um, we went to some festivals. Like We're really proud that we could attend uh, Seagraph LA last summer. We got to see a lot of amazing projects, like we were exhibiting next to Disney, for example, so <laughs> that alone was like pretty amazing for us, being student. Uh, then we got invited to Seagraph Asia as well. We uh, got uh, to select Congress in Zurich in uh, uh, November, like I said, and our next date is in the Athens Digital Art Festival in the 22nd of May. Of May. Um, and like for me, it's something really special and important because I can take the Greek god Morpheus back home. Uh, do you have to say something? Um, maybe just um, to mention the Seagraph. So um, it was a really nice experience for us and many, many important and interesting people came to us. And usually it was when they came to our booth, they were like, mm, well, it's a student project. Mm, yeah, okay, maybe I can try it. And then afterward, they played what they were like. Oh wow, that's so so amazing! A cooperative uh, VR game. So um, felt like we really hit a good point there uh, to make a corporate game there because most of them haven't seen VR games with the second player yet. So this was very encouraging. We did a good job, I guess. <laughs> Um, th so that's the whole team that worked on the trailer and the game, and um, I guess that will be it. So thank you. <laughs> and the next one is Mitya, who is going to present to you Pulse of Life. Thank you. Hi, everyone. As already introduced, my name is Mitya Um. I was the game director mostly for Post of Life, which was also a third year project at the Film Academy and just another team. Badly, the uh, other teammates can't also be here because we were also a team of seven, eight people. And I was mainly responsible for uh, game design, game directing, game programming, but I also did some work on uh, modeling texturing for the trailer. Yeah, so first I will tell you something about the story of the whole IP. Um, it's about a post-apocalyptic world that has basically almost no civilization left. The only people that are still in the civilization are relying on those giant jellyfishes, uh, which support them with energy because they're kind of like electri electrified, and they try to attract them towards the remaining ruins of the cities and try to harvest the energy. And the IP is also consisting of a trailer, Pulse of Life, and the game. And now I want to show you the trailer. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, so as I said, there was also a lot of other people involved, not just me. <laughs> and badly they can't be here, but 
Um, we really enjoyed all making this trailer and the game, and I will now tell you more about in detail uh, concept, modeling and stuff, because mostly we took the assets for both of the things. So for example, the hill which you saw and uh, uh, lighting tower are also in the game and they are mostly the same assets. This is some concepts Alex Belvec did, uh, color um, sheet and also the storyboard uh, with a really early version. And we always did um, a lot of concepts also on the jellyfish, on the environment, on trees and whatever. The next thing is some um, early concept uh, which Alex did uh, for the cliff, which you sp uh, later stand on in VR at the lighting tower and also it's the cliff you saw in the last shot where the jellyfish flies over towards the city. This is some small video about modeling and texturing, which I will just play right now. Yeah, this tower was the main asset and it's way more important in the game because as you see those light chains are a key element to the game which I will tell you about in a moment. The game task mainly is that you're one of these outpost guys and your job is to attract the jellyfish towards the city so the people in the city can harvest the energy. And it uh, relies on two things, VR and a real world component, uh, which was a generator. Um, I will just quickly show it on the next slide. It looked basically like the thing on the left. <laughs> it was attached to a barrel because we tested it early and it was standing on the ground, which we, you will later see also in the experience trailer. And people were really uncomfortable like going to the ground with VR on and touching some real component which they saw in a virtual reality, so we attach it to a barrel so you can stand and see it. And right next to it you can see the virtual version of it, and also the barrel, there's also walkie-talkie, which you one of the Vive controllers turns into a walkie-talkie, and you get also sound input with 3D sound, but uh, the generator was more important because it had to fit the real object really close and also it had to be calibrated really good because you needed to be able to touch it right on the spot. And we did that by attaching a Vive controller to the back and calibrating it um, with the virtual uh, object. You start to get tasks by the walkie-talkie. They tell you to turn on the generator. There's also buttons attached. On the front side, maybe you've seen it, the red and the yellow buttons, and they tell you, okay, go ahead and turn on the generator. And then you can start to turn the winch and light uh, chains above you will light up. And if you reach a certain threshold, which is 25 at the moment, I think, um, the jellyfish starts to appear uh, in a pre-rendered video, which was done at a, uh, projected on a sphere around and before stereo comped by the trailer team mostly. Uh, this is some more work on the game uh, real prop because it had to also be a system that we could easily detach and reattach to take it with, for example, to ITFS last year or maybe to our festivals. Yeah, so there's a video of pre-rendered footage so you can see how the stereo comp works or worked. Oh no, this is the, this is the experience, sorry.
Yeah, so sorry for the bad acting as well. <laughs> Um, yeah, as you have seen, there's like um, this pre-rendered stuff, and uh, yeah, okay. And it was really uh, a really really cool experience because you can't really see it if you haven't tested it in VR. But the jellyfish was huge, and if you have seen the trailer and then tested this thing, uh, you could then see how big the jellyfish actually was because I think like the trailer looks. Uh, looks good, but you can't really feel how, how big it is. And in VR, it was like all over the place. Basically, you could like up in any direction and you could always see the jellyfish, which was a really cool um, experience. Yeah, next on, I will show you a video of pre-rendered footage so you can see how the um, stereo comp worked. It's just some footage of the jellyfish and also of the environment, just a short clip of the jellyfish uh, badly. Yeah, basically hard to see, but there's like slight movement in the trees and it's like the further background of the of the whole scene and in the next video you can see the close environment which was in real time because as you've seen the jellyfish has a lot of particle effects going on and this wouldn't be um, compatible with VR yet because it's just too, uh, too hardware heavy and so we decided to pre-render it. And here you can see some particle effects uh, which were, was triggered by the jellyfish when it fly over. So there was also some connection to the pre-rendered stuff. Yeah, and that's basically it. Uh, thanks first for listening. If you have any question to any team, I guess, you can just come up later to us. And otherwise, I would say thanks uh, all to you for listening to all the projects and have a good time at FMX.